Welcome everybody to our second lecture in our course on pattern recognition. And here is uh, what we are going to do today. <clears throat> it says food for thought. Things will become rather abstract quite quickly. And I thought, well, you know, let us begin with, uh, with something fun. Let's have fun today. And the goal I'm having with today's lecture is to put all of us into the right frame of mind. I am trying to provoke your brains today, I'm trying to sort of point out the intricacies of what it is we call pattern recognition. So there is basically not much to be learned, but many things to be thought of. And without further ado, let's get started. Uh, what is pattern recognition? Hmm? Last time, uh, I ever so briefly already said that there are basically three types of problems we would refer to in the context, in this broader context of pattern recognition. And these problems are regression, clustering, and classification. And we will study all of these problems to quite some extent throughout the course. Right now, I'm not going to repeat what I said about these figures last time. I want, however, to point out that in essence, each of these three tasks, the task of regression, the task of clustering, and the task of classification, deal with essentially the same problem. And what that means is basically what this whole lecture or course will all be about. We, we are going to, going to try to uncover that these three things which apparently uh, seem to solve different kinds of problems, but at the heart of it, that is at the level of the underlying mathematics, all of this is more or less the same. However, uh, what I wanted to talk about today is the fact that IQ tests are all about pattern recognition. All right, I raised this question, what is pattern recognition? Then we saw these three pictures and they basically don't answer anything. Um, so let us try mm -hmm, a different avenue, something you may all be familiar with, I guess. Here is an example. I want you to consider this series of integers, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36. For example, 49. Why would you say 47? <laughs> 49. Let's see, let's see. Aha! How did you know that? How could you know that it was 49? Right. It is 49 because your brains were able to recognize that this short sequence of numbers is uh, the sequence of the first couple of squares. And in um, basically we have that, that, that the end number in this sequence is the end square. And so yeah, it is 49. Great, that was easy, right? So go for this one. Now we have one, one, two, three, five, eight. Does anybody know what sequence that is? Hmm? Yeah, 13 and it is the Fibonacci sequence. So you didn't even have to think about it, you recognized it. Let's see if the answer is indeed 13. Yes, it is. Because these are the first couple of Fibonacci uh, numbers. And we know that there is a process that generates them. And so whenever there is some, some regularity, some process we could identify that creates something, then we say we have identified a pattern. Because it's so much fun, let's do another one. 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13. 17, okay, why? Prime numbers, Those are the primes, or at least the first couple of them, yes. Isn't that amazing? How is your brain able to do that? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. No, I mean, seriously, nobody knows. <laughs> Um, let's slightly modify this, uh, this 
task. Uh, now, instead of continuing a set of numbers, here is a set of numbers, uh, a sequence of numbers. Here is a set of numbers. Uh, 255, 63, 127, 31, 17, and 7. And now I want you to identify the outlier, the one that does not belong. Pardon? It depends. One at a time. <laughs> I think that it's 63 because it's divided by 3. Uh -huh, okay. Any, other Any other suggestions? 63? 17? I hear 17. Why 17? Excellent. Very good. Very good. So yeah, uh, in this case I would say it is 17 because 17 is not a member of the set of all x where x is 2 raised to the power of some n minus 1. It's why I, I've always hated these tests, because there are more than one answer. <laughs> it, will, it will get worse in a minute. Wait for it. <laughs> yeah. See, we have, um, we have uh, already dealt with two problems, uh, predictions, right? This is in a sense, this regression problem, like to continue a sequence of observations. Here we have, um, in a sense, done, done some sort of classification. We have tried to identify a pattern that, that makes uh, five of these numbers to belong to the same class and one of these numbers apparently does not belong to that class. Uh, let's have more fun. Um, instead of numbers, let's go for sequences of symbols. Now we have AA, ABBA, ABBBBA, ABA, ABCA, ABBBBBA and ABBBB. Which ones do not belong? Okay, yeah, that one seems to be and the last one as well, right? How do you know that? How can you make that precise? Yeah. There are more than one examples where A is at the beginning and A is at the end. That sounds interesting, yeah. Can you make that even more precise, that observation? How would you, hmm, if you were to write a program? I think it's, if, if we use Markov chain, and then we will get... Markov chain sounds great, yeah. What about mm -hmm. linear mesh systems? You, you would... Excellent. And what would you... Linear mesh systems. Ah, yeah, Lindemeyer systems is probably a bit of an overkill here, as Chomsky grammar would do. Um, <laughs> as you correctly told me, the two that would probably not belong into this set are the one with the C somewhere in it and the one that does not end with an A. Now, how can we formalize that? We would say that these two strings, sequences of characters, um, are not elements of what we call a formal language, which is just another kind of a mathematical set. So A, B, C, A and A four times B are not elements of the language of, or generated by a grammar G, where this grammar uh, is of course a four tuple, uh, N, T, P and S, where the non-terminal symbols are S and B, the terminals are A and B, and here are the productions. And this grammar basically generates the language of strings that start with an A and then have some sequence of B and they'll definitely end with an A. Right? And you could recognize that and if you would want to, you could make it precise. So there is a mathematical way for us to describe these kind of patterns as well. That was fun. Uh, let's, let's switch gears a bit. Uh, which one does not belong into this set? We have Stockhausen, Bach, Grieg, Beethoven, Brahms and Wagner. Uh, first of all, what, what is this? Hmm? Yeah, it's a set of names of composers. And I have already heard Stockhausen. Why would you say Stockhausen? I know that the other guys are composers. I don't oh, Stockhausen is a composer as well. Ah, okay. So. They are all composers. Which one does not belong? So Interesting, Greek. hey? Greek is not German. Oh, Greek is not German, that's right. But um, why is this more difficult than the previous ones? You need to know anything about the 
we, we need to know more, right? Mm -hmm. Apparently we don't know enough. How is that that we don't know enough? Because we are not experts on classical music? Is it that? Hmm, let's see. Um, it could be Stockhausen because he was not a classical composer. He's a famous composer of uh, atonal music, 12, 12 tone music. So Stockhausen would be an appropriate answer here. But how about this one? What about Bach? He's the only guy in that set that was born prior to 1700. Hmm? And I've already heard that Greek was Norwegian, whereas the others are all German. You help me out. What's going on here? What's the problem? We need restrictions for our language. Excellent, excellent. It is not that we apparently are not all experts on sort of classical music, even if we were we could not answer this problem. It is underspecified. Right. So let's try it again. I'll switch to the next slide and I hope the answer will pop out immediately. <coughs> I have slightly extended that set. Greek. Greek. <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> now, Greek is the only one who is not of German uh, descent. Greek, he was Norwegian. Can you complete this relation? Tiny is too large as mouse to either grasshopper, elephant, courage, or virus. What, what is elephant? elephant? Let's see. Okay, seems to be right. Why? Yeah, uh huh, uh huh. Uh, but courage can be great, right? Or you can have a lot of courage. How do you know, or how do your brains know that the best answer seems to be elephant out of these four choices here? Because courage is abstract, I think, and elephant we can imagine. And how do you know that? <laughs> See? But I'm see, in order to provide me with that answer, you are reasoning about a lot of stuff you have in your head, right? A lot of background knowledge. A lot of information that is not provided on this slide. But your brains have access to it anyway. And they use that to answer this question. Can you cluster these nine objects into three groups of three? With one line? Hmm? Or just one? Oh, I, there are nine objects here, right? Apparently, uh, they have attributes such as color, size, and number of vertices. And I want you to produce three sets of three elements. That is, I want you to cluster them into three sets where each of the three sets or clusters contains three elements. Can you do it? It's already there. Cluster based on what? With one line. Aha! Yeah. Well, who said cluster based on what? Ah, very good question! Based on what? I didn't tell you. You did. Hmm? You did. I, I said I want to have three groups of three, but I didn't say group them according to number of vertices, or group them according to size, or group them according to color. This is another ill posed problem. This is similar to this problem with the composers we've seen earlier. Right? And I'm using this one just um, already at this point in the lecture because uh, if you read, um, I don't know, textbooks and scientific literature on pentagram recognition, and they always, uh, most of them do not actually discuss 
the problem that clustering can be an ill-defined problem. Right? We can, like with, with the information I have given you here, this is a task you cannot solve or you cannot solve uniquely. Of course, there are three, at least three different ways. Uh, we could group all the triangles into one cluster, we could group all the squares, all the um, uh, pentagons, or we could uh, use the sizes to produce clusters, or we could go for the colors. All right? But this, it, is, it is underspecified, and uh, I'm using this example to point out at this point already that it may indeed happen that when you do pattern recognition in practice, using all the math we are going to learn about, uh, it may not help you. All the math may not be enough to solve certain problems. And um, I don't know if, if you sort of felt the same, but when I, when I asked you to group this into groups of three, there was a moment of hesitation. Right. Your brains were beginning to think about it very unconsciously. You don't even actively think about that. Your brains began to ponder that problem and immediately realized, unconsciously, that something fishy is going on here. But your brains love that. And the take-home message from what we have discussed so far is, is that the brain, the human brain, is a pattern recognition apparatus. And given the examples we have seen so far, it seems that the notion of pattern has to do with structure or with analogy. When we had this uh, tiny too large is mouse to what, like, you know, drawing analogies. Um, or yet in another sense, has to do with similarity. So tiny and mouse are similar in a sense, in a certain sense, which is really difficult to make precise in comparison to the examples with the sequences we've so seen earlier, in comparison to the examples of sets. Uh, so tiny and mouse is somewhat similar and, and large and elephant seems to be also similar in that context. Yeah, but, you know, we still have not made precise what a pattern is. And I said pattern seems to have to do with structure, but what is structure? We have seen that uh, structure can be something um, we describe or define in, term or in terms of mathematical operations, like those sets we've seen earlier, powers of 2 minus 1, or uh, languages generated by some grammar. Um, we discussed... The problem, actually, we really discussed that, not in depth, but already discussed it, this problem of how, how do we draw analogies? Like, why was the answer elephant and not courage? And, and how would we ever go in, uh, to measure similarities? Right. This, this, is, this is the food for thought aspect of today's lecture. Think about it until next time. And we also saw, and at least talked about the um, yeah, relation between tiny and large, and mouse and whatever, or when we talked about the composers, that pattern recognition apparently requires some sort of prior knowledge, um, or background knowledge, or prior information. All the stuff in red are, are things that, um, are terms I consider important. So whenever something is important, then I color it in red. And from the next lecture on, I will actually be more precise about these red things. How do we represent prior information? Like, how is it that your brains know that the answer was elephant and not courage? We don't know. We really don't know how the brain does it. And our task as computer scientists is to come up with data structures and algorithms that would allow us to do so. Because if we could, then we could do pattern recognition using computers. If we knew how to represent prior information, uh, we could do that and emulate the amazing capabilities of our brains using computer programs. 
And again, from the examples we have seen so far, it seems as if um, the problem of automatic pattern recognition has a lot to do with mathematics. Uh, when we went through these sequence examples, um, in particular, I guess, the example with the, with the uh, strings, um, something with the numbers that is you know everybody can do that with the strings it was already a bit more involved to to explain why a certain string would not belong into a set but we could come up with a mathematical description of uh, certain sets and then easily distinguish membership or not so the examples we have seen so far serve as a reminder that we will need mathematics. In particular, if we look at terms such as similarity or information, they are very well established mathematical concepts. And the kind of mathematics we are going to use um, basically evolves around areas such as formal languages, geometry, linear algebra, statistics, probability theory, and optimization. And out of these many, many mathematical areas, the ones that are of particular interest to us in this course are uh, at least linear algebra, statistics, probability theory, and optimization, geometry, um, in a sense, I subsume it under linear algebra. Uh, formal languages, maybe, maybe not so much. I'll, I'll have to see how, how things go. So these are the kind of things we are going to study in this course in order to be able to answer these kind of questions. Okay, um, we have, for the fun of it, looked at a couple of pattern recognition problems we may find in IQ tests and uh, what we need in order to answer these questions is a certain form of intelligence, a certain form of uh, prior knowledge. We need to know about the existence of, say, square numbers in order to recognize a sequence of square numbers and then to predict the next one. Um, but of course, we, we also have to, say, uh, perceive whatever is in front of us and make sense of these perceptions. And again, like, you know, <laughs> perception is basically pattern recognition. Uh, so I thought let's, you know, again for the fun of it, have a look at um, some amazing capabilities of our brains. What is this? A cube. Where is there a cube? <laughs> Nowhere, but now that the word cube has been mentioned, you cannot but see it. Who doesn't see a cube? You don't see a cube? Okay, let me make it more precise. Do, do you see a cube now? Now, now the cube is hidden behind a, a slice of tris, Swiss cheese. There is no slice of Swiss cheese on this slide. All right? And there is definitely no wireframe model of a cube. How does your brain insist on seeing a cube? Because his no, nature no. is to, to see the pattern. Exactly. It wants to see regularity. It wants to map stuff it perceives onto stuff it knows about. And in this silly example, it appears as if a simple, valid explanation of what is going on here is that there is a wireframe model of a cube, and we look at it through a slice of Swiss cheese. But none of these things is really there. Your brain insists on it nevertheless. Can you read these four words to me as fast as possible? That sounds good. Let's repeat this exercise. 
What's going on here? What have I done to you? I have caused cognitive dissonance. That of course we can read yellow, blue, green, and red. But at the same time, there is another cue, another piece of information that contradicts our knowledge as to the meaning of the word yellow because it is shown in green. And if I were to repeat this experiment with each of you, one for one for one, and would time it, like measure how much time it takes you to read these four words and measure how much time it takes you to read these four words, we would find significantly that it would take more time to read these four words. Which is crazy because it's not difficult to read. You know, I mean, everybody in this room should be able to read. And uh, so how, how is it that I could sort of force you or enforce it on you to read slower? It is because cognitive dissonance. Your brain knows that yellow actually means this color. And it reads the word yellow, but it is shown in green. And that causes a ever so tiny temporal delay. Can you read this thing here? The English are very proud of that sentence. Do you know why? <laughs> yeah. It has, it contains all the 26 letters of the uh, Latin alphabet. And actually in a, in a form that makes sense. So this is why I'm very proud of it. Every letter is in there. Some of them a couple of times, but they're all in there. Okay, so the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Now, read this. Not so difficult. Pardon? Not so difficult. It's not so difficult. Exactly, exactly. Actually, there have been psychological experiments, and it's, it's extremely well established by now, that all you need in order to read a word, if, if the um, letters are scrambled, whenever the first and last letter are not scrambled, you'll read the word anyway. It's true. How? Nobody knows. Brains like to do it. They have no problem with that. This, because our brain is constantly looking out for stuff it knows. Right? And kikuk, that's quick. I know quick. Right? Kikuk, quick. Let's, let's go for something. Let's go for an explanation we are familiar with or comfortable with. So, the take-home message here is, or from, from these couple of examples, is that the brain <coughs> is indeed the best pattern recognition apparatus out there. Right? When we ask the question, uh, is pattern recognition possible at all? Like, you know, is there reason for us to hope that we can do it automatically? Um, we can easily answer that question um, in form of an existence proof Namely, by saying, yes, the human brain can do it. Right? So it seems to be possible. And indeed, um, given the universe we know so far, there may be other things out there. We haven't seen them yet. But in the world we know, there is no pattern recognition apparatus as powerful as the human brain. It even sees patterns where there are none, right? We have seen that. And this is because there is so much knowledge represented in what way, however, we don't really know that in our brains. Our brains have access to vast amounts of prior knowledge. And, and also what they do is our brains, they weigh sort of uh, 
larger versus smaller patterns. This is uh, what happens with, with these kind of words. Like the larger pattern is uh, Q and K at the end and some U, I and C in it. That must be quick, right? Even though it's, like it's not... Th the larger pattern seems to be that these two letters are at the beginning and at the end. And that is good enough for our brains to make some form of sense of that. And of course, uh, that can be a bug when you have a typo in your papers. Right? But you just don't see it. And it also filters, or the brain filters, unimportant information. Um, and that is to say it pays attention. And if you think about it, like now in this setting here, we are in, in a lecture room. Um, I hope we are not hearing impaired or visually impaired. So we see a lot of things, we hear a lot of things, um, our body is in a certain posture, so muscle reflexes are, are in a certain uh, state. There are so many sensory impressions uh, bombarding our brain every waking seconds of our lives. It is impossible for the brain to consciously process them all and so it has to throw away stuff that is not important and it has to be able to sort of focus its attention on the stuff that matters and right now I hope that your brains are focused on me <laughs> just kidding right because uh, what is it that matters in this setting right now is that that I am telling you stories it's not so much the question I'm am I comfortable in my share that may become more important later on, but at this point it shouldn't be. And I have already said it, sometimes these features can be turned into bugs. So if there's a typo in, in our papers, we don't find it. We've seen this example of cognitive dissonance. Um, optical illusions, and in a certain sense, this example with the wireframe cube uh, is, is a form of optical illusion because we see a cube even if there is none. Um, and all of magic depends on it. Uh, this, this is what magicians do. They sort of, uh, they are very, very well informed about what the brain likes and what it doesn't like. And they create attention and do something here. And because something happened, your brains immediately focus on oh, what's going on there and, and the really important thing is going on behind my back. Right? This, this is magic. And again, here, here are, are the mathematical or psychological terms that, that are important in this context. There's prior knowledge again, macroscopic and microscopic patterns, uh, filtering information and attention. Okay, um, when we are talking about attention, I've already said that there's so much information bombarding our brains, we sort of need to um, filter the unimportant one. Or another way of talking about this would be to say that we need to reduce the complexity of the entirety of what we perceive. And uh, here is a very simple example. Um, this is a picture of what? Llama. A llama, yeah. Uh, but is there just a llama? Isn't that great? I mean, this is def there's definitely more than a llama in this picture. But it appears that the important thing is the llama. And without consciously thinking about it, it's just there. This is a llama. But the llama is in front of some, what is it? It's a wall, actually, a moss-covered wall, uh, standing on some meadow. And actually, I took this picture where? In Norway. <laughs> there are llamas in Norway. Uh, <laughs> what I'm showing you here is the so-called gray value histogram of this uh, gray value image. This image was originally a color image, but I have removed all the colors, and all that is left is intensity information. And um, 
And still, without colors, we are able to recognize there is a llama in front of something which I tell you is a wall, uh, and it stands on some kind of meadow. Well, we can see that. At least now that I've mentioned it, you will all see it. But this picture in our computers is just a matrix, a two-dimensional array, of a lot of, some thousands, uh, pixels. And these pixels uh, correspond to numbers between 0 and 255 and the smaller the number is, the darker the corresponding pixel is and the brighter the number is, so the brighter the pixel. So it's basically intensities between black and white, so shades of grey. And we can then count how often uh, do we find a pixel with a value of 0 in this image how often do we find a pixel I know with a value of 150 in this image? And how often do we find a pixel with a value of 255 in this image? And if we plot these counts versus the pixel values, we get something like this, and this is called a histogram. And then we can normalize this histogram in the sense that we just divide each count we have counted by the total number of pixels in this image. And that then causes this histogram to become a probability distribution. Because if we were to add the values of these normalized histograms from here to there, we would find that they add to 1. So um, in fact, I'm showing you a normalized histogram here, which is to say I'm showing you a discrete probability theory, um, distribution. And then there is a number underneath this histogram and it's called H and it evaluates to 5.06. And this number is the entropy of this histogram, of this probability distribution. And entropy is a thing to measure what? Hmm? Uh, can you say it again? Impurity. Impurity is an interesting uh, term. Um, yes. Yeah. Uncertainty. Uncertainty is a great one as well. Yes. And another one is complexity. So entropy. Uh, I'm not at this point. I'm not going to talk about entropy in, in any detail whatsoever. Let's just say it is, as you said, a measure of. We can understand it as a measure of uncertainty. Or as a measure of complexity. Now, in what sense would this image of the llama be complex? Well, it is complex in the sense that there are a couple of thousand of pixels in this image. And they have, all of these pixels have values between 0 and 255. And apparently, all these values actually appear in this image to a certain amount. But when we determine that this image shows a llama. It does not matter what the intensity value of this pixel is, or what the intensity value of this pixel is, or of this pixel. So there seems to be a, a lot of complexity, which in a sense is overkill with respect to the problem of deciding very quickly that there is a llama here. All right, and now let me finally show you another image. This one. Uh, what does this show? <laughs> it's, it's really difficult uh, for us, if, if this wasn't here, to say that this is a llama. We could probably do it, actually. The shape is very characteristic. But what I have done here is, um, and I did it manually, right? I have, myself, decided that this image basically shows three things. Namely, it shows a llama, some background with it, which is a wall, and some foreground with it, which is a meadow. And then I have segmented this image manually, I didn't do it with, a, with an algorithm, I did it manually, into three parts. And I have randomly chosen three different intensity values to indicate these segments. And as it so happens, I have colored the background in black, and the foreground in gray, and the llama in white. 
And of course, we can discuss or not if this pixel here should have been a part of the llama of the well, I don't care. It's not important. We can discuss these things, but let's not. The important thing is we can compute the normalized histogram of this image as well and then get this. Well, it makes sense. There are just three intensity values left in this image. Uh, and, and note that they are considerably, that the percentages are considerably larger than in the original image, which makes sense because you know, now there's really, really many pixels which we know are definitely black, more than 50%. Uh, a lot of pixels that are definitely in some shade of gray and also quite a number of pixels uh, that are white. And if we compute the entropy of this distribution, we find that it is now 1.04. So what has happened? What is the implicit effect of my coloring this image or segmenting this image into these three regions? And of course, I could have colored like uh, this bar here black, this bar white, and this bar. I didn't do that right, because my brain didn't see three segments like that in this image. What my brain saw was foreground, background, llama, and I used that to, you know, color foreground, background, and llama. What I'm trying to hit home here is that pattern recognition seems to have to do with reduction of entropy. Okay, um, let's play another game. Look at this. Uh, here is a very simple, what is it, 10 by 10 uh, image. So these, th these things are pixels here. And I have colored them in two colors, uh, gray and white and I have covered a certain part of this image. All right, and um, this is again some sort of IQ test, just as the ones we started with. I want you to tell me what is under the red cover. Let's go for an example. So in this uh, case, I guess this is a good prediction, right? Do we all agree? Do you understand the game? There will be images parts of which I cover, and you are going to tell me what's under the cover, all right? What's under the cover? The same bars. Bars? Okay. Let's see. Aha! Good. All right. What's under the cover? Hmm? Can you like predict what will be, pardon? Squares, yeah, it's like diagonals, right? Sort of, let's see, looks good. Checkerboard pattern. What is under this cover? Pardon? I, I still didn't hear it. Okay, why would you say so? There is something that is called the incongruity theory of humor. And uh, that posits that the brain constantly looks out for patterns to learn about the environment. We have talked about this. Our brains are constantly looking for patterns. And if an expectation, some pattern we assume, changes or is not as we expected it, we are surprised and therefore delighted, and we were, I could hear it, and laugh, because we learned something. So things are funny because, at least some area of, of humor, because there is a discrepancy between what we expect and what happens. And you see, like many, many jokes have this pattern of three, like blah, blah, blah does this, blah, blah, blah does that, blah, blah, blah does something else, ha, 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 ha. Right? Because the, the comedian establishes a pattern and then breaks it. And this is exactly what I did here. And it was funny, even though, like, you know, looking at these things, why should this be funny? 
But it is. It's just because I have established a pattern. You began, you know, following that pattern. Then I violated it, and it was funny. Comedy is indeed about learning or establishing patterns or ever so small sets of prior information. What is under this cover? I, I'm not going to um, fool you here. <laughs> the others, right? I mean, <laughs> why, why wasn't there anybody willing to tell me what we'll find under this cover? Because there's no pattern here. There is no pattern that would stick out to our human brains. Right? I may be some alien from some outer planet somewhere, and this might actually mean something to me. I don't know. Right? It could be. could be the letter A. Who knows? <laughs> uh, but to us, this doesn't mean anything. Right? And, and this, again, goes back to the question, what is a pattern? What distinguishes a pattern from something that is not a pattern? What, what is, like, is, is this chaotic? Is there some form of structure here? Why don't we see some structure here? Some aliens may see structure. Maybe even a bee would see something here. I don't know. I don't know. So take home message from, from uh, these funny examples are that pattern recognition seems to have to do with uh, complexity reduction. And uh, we can therefore also understand it as a form of compression. We go back to the um, uh, Lama image here. It, it would take much more, say, memory on, on the uh, hard disk, hard drive, to, to store this image uh, than this, because this one could be compressed very easily to, to a very ridiculously low amount of uh, information or um, memory costs. Um, why is that? Because we have reduced the complexity according to a pattern we found. And we could actually use that to um, reduce all of the information that is out there. And this is why our brains do pattern recognition, because there's way too much information bombarding us in every waking second of our lives. So it actually makes sense to try to attach meaning to all the stuff we see, we hear, we feel, we taste. But it doesn't always help. No, no, of course. For example, we see a circle yeah. for the second we can say what it is. Maybe go in it, maybe it's sound. Yeah. Um, but, <coughs> okay, instead of um, coloring this here, I could have, of course, um, I don't know, attached a word to every pixel, and I could have um, called these pixels background, 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 yeah. and white, white, or lava, 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 so I mean with circles like this. But the fact that I used colors here to sort of emphasize the objects I found is just because I wanted to hit home the entropy reduction thing, right? Um, because in this image, think about it, I could say, um, tail of the llama, ear, eye, nose, mouth, um, leaves of grass, leaves of grass, leaves of grass, moss, stone, moss, 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 a lot of stuff is going on there, right? But I can also say llama, 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 grass, 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 background, background, background. And, and then I could have done these histograms over the words I would have attached to every pixel and the effect would have been the same. But of course, it is very difficult for me to create pictures with lots of words. So this is why I did here. There is no deeper meaning uh, to the fact that I used colors to demonstrate this effect of entropy reduction. Right? Now, yeah, okay, so then uh, the question obviously is um, how to measure complexity. We've already met one idea, it's, it's to resort to the concept of entropy, uh, but there are others out there. Uh, for instance, the notion of the fractal dimension of something. There is this idea of the description length. Uh, there are notions of degrees of hierarchies and so on and so forth. What I'm trying to say here is that 
the problem of what is complexity is a surprisingly open one. And it's true. Uh, we would say, you know, complexity, that, that should be easy to define or easy to characterize mathematically. And in a certain sense it is, because there are lots of ideas out there. But because there are so many ideas out there, it also at the same time seems as if it is not that straightforward. And indeed it is not. And all of this, again, is just food for thought. Think about all these things we usually don't think about. Like, how is it that we don't run against a wall constantly? How is it that we can uh, listen to our friends while riding the, the tram, even though there's like dozens of people talking all around us? All these kind of like, how, how do our brains do pattern recognition? What is it they use to minimize complexity? So, what is pattern recognition? Now that we've seen at least phenomena that, that allude to the problem of pattern recognition and let's let's ask what is it let's define it hmm let's go with uh, Watanabe first pattern recognition is claims Watanabe a quest for the minimum entropy minimum entropy uh, where our system of categories whatever that is uh, used in the representation of the data is to be adaptively adjusted and the entropy is suitably defined that's a cool definition, right? What does it say? Nothing. Nothing. This is mumbo jumbo. Here's Niemann. A pattern recognition is research and development concerning mathematical and technical aspects of perception. What does that say? Nothing. What is aspect? What is perception? Right? In order for this to mean something, we would have to have a precise understanding of uh, the technical aspects of perception. Uh, Shalkov. The science that concerns the description or classification of measurements. What does that mean? I, I like this. This is getting closer. Uh, it's classification of measurements. Measurements is, is you know... If we know what that is. We have some apparatus to measure something, a ruler to measure lengths, a scale to measure weights, whatever. Clocks to measure time. Uh, if measurement is cool, that, that can be done. And classification, well, that is again something that at least intuitively makes sense. Uh, we can say if somebody is, is tall or small. So it uh, seems as if we're getting there. Here are Duda and Hart. The assignment of physical objects or events to one of several predefined categories. That is easy. Male, female, male, female, female, male, 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 female, male, male, and female. See, I can do that. I had two predefined categories, male and female, and um, a couple of objects, excuse me. Can do that, right? We are all physical objects. And I can assign categories to those. But where do these categories come from? They don't say. Here's Ripley. Given some examples of complex signals and the correct decision for them, make decisions automatically for a stream of future examples. Oh, that's a cool one, right? Because that actually really captures what we did at the beginning of the lecture. So in that sense, this is a good one. Uh, this, this, it, it begins to make sense. But it's, it's extremely verbose, isn't it? Still not pattern recognition equals and then something. It's like, you know, the sentence is like this. Oh, Bishop says, it's concerned with the automatic discovery of regularities in data through the use of computer algorithms, first time that a computer comes into play, and with the use of these regularities to take actions such as classifying the data into different categories. There's the classification again and the categories. And, and, and the regularities are there, right? Remember when we did the sequences and the sets? Regularities. So our brains somehow do this. Now Bishop says pattern recognition is actually to use computer algorithms for that purpose. 
I can continue this for all time. Here's Fukunaga. A problem of estimating density functions in a high dimensional space and dividing the space into regions of categories or classes. What does that mean? That means read the book. Pardon? That means read the remaining book. <laughs> right. um, believe it or not, this one is actually the best one <laughs> of all all the things. Why? Uh, because it is in fact the most mathematical one. Right? Of course it, it does not mean anything to us at this point and we will try throughout this course to develop an understanding of what Fukunaga is trying to say but of all the ones we have seen so far this is actually the one that comes closest to providing us with an idea as to how to do it on a computer. Uh, Schumann says the problem of giving names omega to observations x. Uh, it's cool. Um, this is it's, uh, probably not immediately apparent, but very mathematical. And then we have Morse concerned with answering the question, what is this? And this is the one you should uh, tell your grandparents if they ask you what you are learning in university right now. Pattern recognition. What is pattern recognition? Yeah, this is the problem of answering the question, what is this? Everybody understands that, okay? And, and I said I can continue this forever, and I could. I, I mean, I really mean it. I can. You read some text on, on the subject, and you find attempts of definitions. There really seems to be in a certain sense, an ill-posed problem. The question of defining what is pattern recognition appears not to be straightforward. It's again a pattern recognition. It is <laughs> a pattern recognition problem. And um, here is a tentative word count of the um, definitions uh, or I count, I created a histogram over certain words. Uh, the counts are over there and the bins are here. And actually you see that I have summarized categories in the bins. Uh, <laughs> so it appears as if people agree that pattern recognition has to do with category decision class name. Why would I group these four terms together? It's a pattern recognition problem, right? <laughs> it's, it's similar to this uh, tiny is too large as mouse is too whatever. So category is, is, is probably just another name for class or name. When I say category is just another name for class, then name even pops up. And decision is to say male, female, male, female, and so on and so on. Right? Seems to be the same thing. And then there is uh, this complex of measurement, signal, object, observation, data. Seems also to be the same. And then there was uh, classification and assignment. Yeah, I probably should put decision to classification. That's not what I don't really uh, then, interestingly, mathematics algorithm function appeared a couple of times, automatic a couple of times, and representation was there as well. And uh, yeah, so this seems to be pattern recognition. Yeah. What can we say? In fact, that's all I have for today. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, this, this, is, this is the state of affairs and uh, again this was just to provoke you, uh, food for thought, ponder this, ponder all of this uh, and um, yeah, it, it puts you in the mood for the things that are to come. Do you have any questions about any of the things we discussed today? If not, then see you on Monday. Thank you.